Thank you, guys. Thank you for that. And let me just begin this morning by saying thank you to Living Faith. You guys, over the past uh, week, have made me proud uh, to be a part of this family, even more though more than ever. Uh, you guys really uh, stepped to the plate and uh, went above and beyond, and many uh, actions of uh, sacrifices over the last uh, several days uh, for the Stevens family, and we just want to say thank you. Uh, I, I can't I can't express that enough. And, and uh, when I when I sat down last night, I I told Sandy I said I'm I, I'm never more proud uh, and more excited to be a part of a family of God than I am living faith. Uh, you guys just really, really are awesome, and thank you. Uh, we are still moving toward Christmas, and over these past several weeks, uh, uh, we have uh, been talking about this, and, and, and this is one of those weeks where things will begin to ramp up. It, it is our last week of, of school. College is out, and and those kids are home, and I can just tell you that uh, it was nice to see that car in the driveway last night, Miss Erica. I was very excited uh, to have my Taylor home, and, and uh, those, were, uh, those were exciting times. And, and this is our last week of school, and so um, just a couple more weeks, and I may even get my Christmas tree up, so it's, uh, we're getting close. Uh, the 23rd is coming, and, and uh, so we've got to get there uh, at some point in time. And, you know, we've been talking about this whole uh, idea, and, and the title of this series, and this, maybe, you're, maybe this is the first time you've kind of walked into this, so we're going to go back just a little bit and, and, and talk about uh, where we've been. Uh, you know, we, we, we know that the Christmas story, when we read it most of the time, when we gather those kids around on Christmas Eve, we, we tend to turn to the book of Luke. Uh, we go to the Gospel of Luke in chapter 2 because that's, uh, that's the birth of Jesus and that's the story that's told. And, and we realize that a couple of the Gospels, we have those four accounts of, of the life of Jesus and we realize that uh, in, in Mark and John, we, we don't really have any record of the birth of Jesus uh, being recorded by, by those two Gospels, but we have a, 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 uh, a record of the birth of Jesus recorded in the book of Matthew. But we realize that the book of Matthew begins very differently, and that's what we've been talking about. We've been talking about the fact that Matthew begins his story of Jesus with a genealogy. Now, I remember growing up as a little boy, my, I had several people on both sides of my family that were really interested in our family tree. And, and they spend a lot of time. And if you know someone who's researched this or has gone through yours or realized, it takes a lot of time to do this. It takes, of course, that was back before uh, we had the web and, and all those things. And, and so back then it was going to cemeteries and it was going to the library and it was going through records and trying to dig through and trying to find these things out. And, and sometimes you ask yourself the question, why are you even looking? <laughs> why would you even dig into your past? Why would you dig into your family tree? And what we tend to find is, is that what becomes very interesting is when we go through our family tree, we're kind of looking to see who we might be related to that might be famous. You know, when you go back, who, who could be maybe, how are we related to a, a, a former president? Or maybe a general? Or maybe somebody who was, who was famous in, in music or in artistry or something? You start looking for all those names. It's like, look, we're related to this person. And this is a person in our family history that we're very proud of. And this is a person in our family history that we want to just kind of highlight. And something that we want to kind of stand. And, and sometimes when you begin to dig through your family tree, you begin to find people's names that you would like to forget. And you would like to say, oh, I don't really want to know that I'm related to that person. And, and I would just really somehow find a way if we could just maybe leave that person out. And, and we really don't want anyone to know that we're related to that person. And as we begin to explore this gospel of, of, of Matthew, we realize that he, he records this whole genealogy of, of Jesus. And, and there's some people that he includes in that genealogy that you might would think, he could leave out. Uh, there were some names there that, that, that as his readers, he was writing to this uh, culture of, of Jews. He was writing to this modern, uh, for his time, it was this modern day group of people that, that understood Old Testament history. They understood where their nation had come from. And, and some of these names that Matthew drops in the genealogy of Jesus would make them go, What? Why was he including this? Why wouldn't he just kind of went on through that? He could have left those names out. And, and there's several that he includes, and that's what we've been looking at, and that's what we've been, been talking about. He, he goes through this because we realize that the very first thing that he would want to do is he has to tie Jesus. If he's going to convince anyone that Jesus is the Messiah, he has to tie Jesus to the line of David. Well, he goes beyond that. He goes all the way back to Abraham, and he traces Abraham down to David, and then he goes from David all the way to Jesus. 
And, and you say, well, he accomplished his goal, right? Well, there were some folks that he included in that genealogy that he could have left out. He didn't really have to include them to still prove the point that Jesus descended from King David. So what was the point? Why would he include those individuals in the genealogy of Jesus? Unless they were the point of the story that he was about to tell. And so for the past several weeks, we've gone through this genealogy and we've looked at different characters and different people that Matthew has included. And as we discovered uh, in looking at this, we realized that Matthew himself was one of these characters. Matthew was a person with a past. Matthew was a person with, that had been redeemed. Matthew was a person that had, had been in a place, and, and even that first moment that he, that he met Jesus, he was, he was sitting in a tax collector's booth. And we talked about how low tax collectors were, okay? Just down at the bottom of the barrel. They had their own little uh, category of bad people, okay? Sinners and tax collectors. And that's who Matthew was. And Matthew was about to tell the story of his redemption. Matthew was about to tell the story of his redeemer. Matthew was about to tell the story of Jesus. And so as he begins his story, he begins with his genealogy. And he includes these people that had a colorful and very questionable past. So let's go back. Let's go back and look at this genealogy. And Matthew... In chapter 1, he begins, A record of the genealogy of Jesus, Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah, and his brothers. We read about that last week, didn't we? And his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez, and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. We discovered Tamar last week. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. That's a name right there. If you're looking for boys' names, give that one a shot. Okay. What's your name? Ram. There you go. Ram, the father of Abinadab. Abinadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was... Rahab. Uh oh. There's Rahab. Now, let's talk about Rahab today. <laughs> Let, let's, take, let's talk about this because he, here's the thing Rahab had a label, didn't she? If you're a Bible person, if you've been around the church for a long time, if you've studied Old Testament history, you've done this, okay? And if you've got the kids here today, then they're going to be asking you, what does this mean? And you have fun with that, okay? You'll work through that, but, 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 you, but we'll be okay. I'll help you if I need to. But, but in the Old Testament, if you, read, if you grew up with the King James, you know that, that she, was, she had this title to her name. And you never saw or never read about Rahab unless it was Rahab the harlot, Okay? That's what her title was, and you know that. There's lots of Old Testament and the New Testament and Bible characters and lots of things that have, that have these labels, right? John the, John the Baptist, right? Okay, John the Baptist. Uriah, this is a tough one, Uriah the Hittite. Yeah, we're going to talk about him next week. Alexander the, Attila the, Conan the, okay, maybe they're not all Bible characters, Okay. Buffy the, okay, all right, and here, how about this week, Jabba the, okay, it's coming, right, all right, well, throughout history and, and, and also in fiction, it is not uncommon for a person to have a word that describes them, a label that is attached to them, somehow permanently attached to their character, somehow permanently attached to who they are. And every time you hear that name, you automatically pull in that label. And Rahab was one of those people. So if you grew up in that, in that time, if you, if you grew up a Bible person, if you were ever in Sunday school, if you've ever read, then, then you just get that. When you saw, when I said Rahab in the, when I said, and that's what people in Matthew's time, he's writing to these people, and they're reading this genealogy. And when they saw Rahab's name, that's what popped in their head. Guarantee it. That's what popped in their head. Why would he include that? So that created some tension 
here in the genealogy of Jesus. And as we begin to discover her story, we'll realize that she's not even Jewish. Okay, She's not even Jewish. She was a Canaanite. So, so here's Matthew, and he's, and he's telling the Christmas story, right? You're thinking, this is a Christmas story. And he includes Rahab. He includes Rahab the harlot. And here's the thing. This is where you have to really contextualize this. The story of Rahab, we're getting ready to look at that. Okay, The story of Rahab took place really soon after the law of Moses was given. Okay, And I would say that the ink was not even dry, but it wasn't ink. They chiseled it out of stone, right? Okay, So the dust was still fresh on the law. Okay, They had just received the law of Moses. They had just received, and in that law were some pretty stiff penalties for a person with a reputation of a woman like Rahab. Okay, so this, was, this is why this story is, is, so, is so important, because, because they had just received the law. So why would Matthew choose to draw attention to Rahab? Well, he chose to draw attention to her because she's part of the story. And not only is she part of the story, she's the point of the story. And she is part of the point of Christmas. If you'd like to follow some, we're going to go back to Joshua in chapter 2. And, and this is where we begin to find the story of, of Rahab. The Israelites had come from Egypt, and, and you guys know the story with, with Moses. They had sent the spies in, the spies came back, and, and, and they didn't have enough faith, so they wandered in the wilderness, and Moses died, and Joshua takes over, and, and now it's time to take the promised land. A new generation has come and it's time to take the promised land and, 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 but it's still pretty fresh and they're really a brand new nation because they have been enslaved and when they went to Egypt we, we talked about that story last week when, when, when Joseph went to Egypt it was just one and then he brought his family his, his, uh, his 11 brothers and, and, and they come down and they brought their family so there was just a handful of them but now hundreds of years later the, the numbers of Israelites number in the, in the hundreds of thousands. Some people think it's as high as 2 million people and Moses comes in and he rescues them. He brings them out and so this is a whole big bunch of people, and it's a brand new nation. And now it's, the, and God says, This is your land. Okay, I'm giving you this land. But the problem was there were people living there lots of people, okay, big people with big cities. And one of those cities was a place called Jericho. And, and, and at this point, they hadn't even crossed the Jordan River. Okay, it's just time to begin the conquest. And, and so Joshua is the new leader. And so this is what Joshua does Joshua sends out some spies to go. Especially, he said, to, to Jericho. And I want you to go in there and see what you find and see what happens. So they go in and they get noticed. Okay, They're seen. So they go to Rahab's house. This is where they go. They go to Rahab's house and, 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 and there they are. And she <laughs> rescues them. Okay, She hides them from the guards. The guards are looking for them. They're trying to find out where they are. And, and they suspect that they're there. So they go up to her house and they ask, have you seen them? Okay, And she said, you know, I think if you just get a posse together and just go outside, I think you'll find them. Take off. And so they go and, and she goes upstairs where she had hidden the two Hebrew spies. And she has a conversation with them. Now, I want you to notice this conversation because it's very very important. It comes to us in Joshua chapter 2 and verse 9. This is what she says to them. Rahab says, I know that the Lord has given this land to you. Okay, and here's the thing. Okay, I know that the Lord has given this land to you and that a great fear of you has fallen on us. So that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. Now, it's very important to understand the word that she uses. Uh, and, and I know what it says in your Bible, but here's the thing. When you look at the Hebrew text, when you look at the Hebrew text, the word that they used to describe how Rahab described God. When Rahab says, I know that God, okay, I know that the Lord, the word that she used to describe that thing, the word they chose to put in the Hebrew text was the name above all names, 
Okay? It, was the, it was the word that they used for God that, that, that many of those scholars would not even speak it. They would only write it. Okay? They would only write it because it was the name above all names. It literally meant the existing one. Okay, so this is the important thing to understand. Her communication with these two Hebrews was, I believe that your God is God. Okay? And she professed her faith in God. And she said, I believe because we have heard what has happened. Okay? We have heard about the Red Sea. All right? We have heard about what happened with the other kings uh, in, in, that, in that region. And, and, and we are scared okay? that there is a great fear among us. And, and here's the reason why. is because we believe, we believe that your God is God. Now that's powerful. That's very powerful. She says that, that I know that the Lord has given this land to you and that a great fear of you has fallen on us and so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for when you came out of Egypt and what you did to Sion and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God. Okay? The Lord your God, she said, is God. And she professed her faith in Him. He is heaven above and on the earth below. And this is what she asked them. This is what she asked them. She says, Now, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family. Because I have shown kindness to you. Give me a sure sign that you will spare the lives of my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them. That you will save us from death. Are you getting this? Are you getting this? That you will save us from death. Because I believe. Because I believe that God is God. Okay, above all these Canaanite gods, above all these idols, above whatever else I've been taught, above whatever else I've seen, above whatever else I've experienced, I'm not part of your deal, I wasn't there, but I've heard, and because of what I've heard and what I've seen, I believe. I believe. So will you save us from death? And the men said, our lives for your lives. Our lives for your lives. The men assured her, if you don't tell what we're doing, we will treat you kindly and faithfully when the Lord gives us the land. And so she let them down on the outside of the city because her house was in the city wall and they escaped. Now, when they got back to Joshua, when they got back to Joshua, this is what they told him. They went down out of the hills and they, they came to Joshua and they told him everything that had happened to him. And they said, look, the Lord has surely given us this land. Because these people are scared to death. They are scared to death. All the people are melting in fear because of us. Well... The story goes on, and we're not going to read all of the pieces. And, and many of you guys have read the story of the crossing of the Jordan. And, and the time comes, and, and, and they have this report, and they know. And so they come, they come to the city of Jericho. And all of these Israelites are there, and everyone is there. And, and of course, by this time, word has gotten out about the Jordan River crossing, and all these people are gathering. And, and so Jericho is, is, is just a city that is sealed up in fear. They're sealed up in fear, and so it's time for the conquest. It's time for the attack, and so all the generals and everybody's there, and everybody's together, and it's like, okay, what's the battle plan? We need the battle plan. We need to know how we're going to take this city, and Joshua comes out and says, okay, this is what we're going to do. You can put all those swords down. You can put all that stuff down. Not going to need those. You're going to need your walking shoes, okay? <laughs> You're going to need your walking shoes because this is what we're going to do. We're going to walk around the city, okay, once, okay? And then the next day, we're going to go around the city once, okay? And here's the deal. I'm not going to do ditto, ditto, ditto. We're going to do the same thing every day for six days. And on the seventh day, we're going to go around the city seven times, okay? 
And then we're going to blow some horns, and then we're going to scream real loud. All right? That's the battle plan. Okay. <laughs> Sounds great. Okay? Let's do it. Okay, let's go. Go team. And so they do this. And so for, for six days, they march around the city once a day. And all these people. And if you can just imagine the, the mental thing for the people inside Jericho. And they're looking and saying, here they are. You know, there's thousands of them, hundreds of thousands of these people. And they're going around in a circle. Is, is it, it's about to happen. No. And then the next day, it's going to happen. No. And then so we go. And then all of a sudden, the seventh day, seven times. And then they blow the trumpets. And the people shout. And the walls just fail. And we don't know how that happened we don't know there's lots of theories whatever happened but God just brought it down okay God brings it down and and then at that point chaos breaks out I mean they just go into the city of Jericho and God delivers this whole city to them and and so it's just it's just insanity and all these things are happening and and people are going in and rushing and and so and, and the Israelites took the city but here in the midst of the craziness Okay, can you imagine hundreds of thousands of people seeing shouting and all these walls and all this stuff, and it's like, whoa, we got this, and, and we're going in. So all this craziness is happening. And in the midst of all that craziness, God reaches in. God reaches in and he saves one family. Okay? He saves one family. Look at this. It, it, we find it in, in Joshua chapter six in the, in verse twenty two. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land. He says, all right, boys, go into the prostitute's house and bring her out. All who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her. So the young men who had been spying went in, and they brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and brothers and all who belonged to her. They brought out her entire family, and they put them in a place Outside the camp of Israel. Wow. (laughs) And so she was saved. She was saved. And here's something I think that's very interesting. Verse 25 says, But Joshua, after they had destroyed the entire city, they burned the whole place down. Everything was just completely destroyed. But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute. With her family and all who belonged to her, because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho. And here, this last line I think is really interesting. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. Did you catch that? And she lives among the Israelites to this very day. Wow. She lives among the Israelites as an example. (laughs) She lives among the Israelites as an example that despite her past, despite her past, God would still offer grace, God would still offer mercy, that God would still offer forgiveness, even to an outsider, even to someone who by their own law should be judged and should be stoned. But she lives among them to this very day. And so now years later, Matthew is writing the genealogy of Jesus. And this story would have stood out to those readers when they read whose mother was Rahab. This story would go, ding! (laughs) And she lives among us to this very day. And it would, it would not just stand out, but it would stand out in stark contrast to the law that they knew. Okay? And, and, and so, much, so much legalism had crept into their world. And, and, and so much uh, of the law was there. And, and all of the, the, the teachings of the Pharisees and all of the things that, that they were dealing with in that time. And, and Matthew would say, remember that Rahab is in the genealogy of Jesus. Because that was the point of the story that Matthew was about to tell. Now what the Bible doesn't really record for us, and we can just, we're kind of left to our own uh, understanding of how this may have happened, but Rahab continued to live uh, in the uh, Israelite camp. And one day there was a man named Salmon. 
who came up to Rahab and said, Hey, I've been reading through this new book called Numbers, and I realized I don't have yours. <laughs> Maybe we could go out for coffee, okay? And whatever happened and however they met and however they did, that's how Josh and Kansas met, by the way, okay? Whatever, okay? But anyway, Rahab married this Jewish man named Salmon. And they had a son. And they named him Boaz. I don't know why, but they named him Boaz. It seemed good at the time, I'm sure. But when Boaz grew up and became older, he was introduced to a young woman named Ruth. And her her story is in the Bible. She's got her own book. Okay, You can read that sometime. It's fascinating. And, and, And Boaz and Ruth actually become the great grandparents of King David. How about that? And Matthew places these names in the genealogy. Of Jesus. At this time, at this time of Rahab, the law of Moses is just brand new. And, 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 and that law would say that a woman like Rahab could not live among them, that she must be cast out, she must be killed. And this is what God says My grace is still broader than my law, my mercy is bigger, okay? and my forgiveness is is bigger. Even then. Okay? And Matthew realizes this is not anything new. Okay? Matthew realizes this is not something new that Jesus has done. This has been God all along. <laughs> this goes all the way back to the beginning. That God would offer his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness for those who believe. For those who confess and who, those who believe. But here's our deal for today. I don't think Rahab's story is really too far removed from our own story. Because if we were to peel back our story, we have some labels too, don't we? We all have labels. If your thoughts were known, if your behavior, your private behavior was known, Things that you don't want anyone to know. We all have a label. Some of us have labels that we've just discovered, so maybe that's why we're here. (laughs) Maybe that's why we've come back to church. There are labels like the liar, the cheater, the adulterer, the addict. Maybe you're just the jerk. The jealous. The coveter. If you could just know what I think about that. So my question for you this morning is this. Do you have a label? Do you have a label? It's what happens when we decide to approach God. When we decide to make that decision that we're going to get close to Him. We remember the label. Or Satan reminds us of the label. And we try to approach God based on our own righteousness. We try to approach God based on all the things that we've done that are good. And then we just want to draw back. We decide that there's no point in trying. And Matthew reminds us, Matthew reminds us that Rahab had a label. And I think Rahab had a label, and and I think Matthew reminds us of that because Matthew had a label too. Matthew had a label too because he was Matthew, the tax collector. And this is what Matthew remembers. Matthew remembers that Jesus walked right up to him in his sin, caught in the act, In the booth with his badge. And Jesus said, Matthew, follow me. Follow me. Notice Jesus didn't come up to him and say, Matthew, when you get your life straightened out, when you get out of this tax collecting business and figure this all out and clean up yourself a little bit, then come and look me up. Here's my card. 
That's not what Jesus said. Jesus walked up to him in the act, in the booth, and said, Matthew, I want you to follow me. That's powerful. That's powerful. Matthew remembers that day. I want you to join me. And then from the genealogy, Matthew begins to tell the story. He begins to tell the story of time after time after time where Jesus walked up to people and said, I'll accept you right where you are. Come, come with me. Come, come with me. Come, come with me. Over and over and over again. And he began to tell the story where Jesus would reach people while they were still wearing their label. And he reminds us that Rahab become the great, 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 I don't know how many greats, grandmother of Jesus. And that became the point of the Christmas story. And that's powerful. It's powerful. And doesn't that challenge you? Doesn't that challenge us all? That the message of Christmas is not, it, it's what God has done for you that you could not do for yourself. You, friends, you have been invited. You have been invited. I think about somebody that may be watching this online and maybe sitting there on their couch. You have been invited to follow Jesus. You have been invited to follow Jesus. Right where you are. Without any change being made. Is that possible? You've been invited to a relationship of grace and forgiveness and mercy. Is that possible? Yeah. It really is. Because Matthew reminds us that this is not new. That Jesus came to pay the price for those sins in the Old Testament. All the way back. Jesus paid the price for Rahab's sin. Jesus paid the price for my sin. Jesus paid the price for your sin. Jesus paid the price for all sin. He covered it all. And that's where the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness is possible. And don't miss this. After that relationship begins, after we say yes to that relationship, then he'll help us. He'll begin chipping away at all those things in our lives. You see, there are so many things that we go back and we think, if I could just you know, unlive this life, if I could unlive that mistake, if I could somehow just go back. Well, you can't go back, but you can be forgiven. You can be forgiven. You can't unlive your life. You can't go back and change that mistake. But grace and mercy and forgiveness will help you and will teach you to move on. And God will take it and he'll use it. And he'll use your story to help others. So here we are. <laughs> and you may be thinking, all right, you got me. I got a label. I've got a label. If you knew my thoughts, if you knew how jealous I am, if you knew how much I covet what my friends have, I've got a label. Is that you? If that's you and you've never reached out to Jesus, I've got some really good news for you. It's Christmas. It's Christmas. And he's reaching out for you today. He's come to you today just like he did to Matthew. And he's saying to you today, come. Come and follow me. So I invite you. I invite you to ask him into your heart. To, to, to accept his relationship. A relationship of forgiveness. A relationship of grace. And a relationship of mercy. And allow him to come into your heart and then begin to change your heart. You don't have to get changed before he comes in. He'll accept you right where you are. If you've never done that, don't delay. It's the greatest gift you'll ever receive. Let's pray. Father, 
you know our hearts. You know our, you know our labels. You know where we are. So, Father, I pray that you just reach, reach down. And Father, in this moment, I pray that, that we can just visualize. That we can just visualize whatever image that we have of Jesus. If we could just take a moment and just, in our minds, whatever that perfect picture of Christ is in our life. That we could just visualize Him walking up to us. And Father, as we look down in front of us, there's a sign. And on that sign is our label. And there it is, right in front of us. We know what it is. We know what we're guilty of. But as we look back up, Jesus is still coming. He's still coming. And as he approaches, he looks us right in the eye. And he's saying, come. Come with me. Come follow me. And I'll give you grace. And I'll show you mercy. And I'll offer you my forgiveness. That sign in front of you, just tear that up. I paid the price for that. You're forgiven. And it's my prayer this morning, Father, that wherever we are, whatever our label, whatever we need to lay down, Father, that we'll just come and receive that gift. Father, maybe we've made a profession of faith. Maybe we've said yes to a relationship and we've been baptized even, but we're, we're just trying to live off of our own goodness. And maybe for the first time, just discovering this and reading this and understanding this, we realize that, that we can't get enough done. We're just, we just continually come up frustrated. It's, it's always a trade-off. We just want to be relieved. We just want it to go. Father, I just pray that you call us this morning. Help us to be obedient. You're standing right in front of us now, saying, come, come with me, call us, guide us. We pray it, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name.